Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Go with me to Acts chapter 1. Um, and we're going to just keep going in a series that we've um, been, been ministering on, on a room where God can move. And, and we started uh, looking at instances in the Bible where God came into situations or Jesus came into places where he wanted to perform his will. How many of you know you want God to do his will in your life? You want God to do his will in your life because it's good. You know what I mean? It's not a question. You know, sometimes, well, I don't, I don't know if I want the will of God or not. You know, he might, you know, put sickness on me or he might put poverty on me. No, that's not the will of God and that's not what God does. He is a good God. Hallelujah. And what he does in people's lives is good. It's blessing. It's, it's multiplication. It's, it's addition. It's increase. It's, it's, a, it's impartation of good things. Hallelujah. You want God to do his will in your life. And we see in the scriptures we were looking at, because we've been out on this for a while, we were looking at how we're, Jesus would come into places like he went into his hometown of Nazareth and he could there do no mighty work. It was a place of unbelief. It was a place where uh, God couldn't come in there and, and bless them and heal them and, and do what he wanted to do. Um, and and, and it, it, it really kind of got us on a study, I believe, in how we are to cooperate with God. There's a there's a, a responsibility that we have to cooperate with God that when he comes into our life, when he comes into our household, when he comes into our church, that he finds a, an environment where he can hook up with us and move and do what he wants to do. Amen. Amen. So because of that, we have to um, take upon our responsibility to have faith present, have, um, you know, uh, unity present. You know, we looked over there in uh, the book of Acts where that group setting, they were in one mind, they were in one accord, and suddenly, hallelujah, the Holy Spirit came upon them, filled them with the Holy Ghost. So unity is a part of that environment that God needs to have his way. And then where we left off talking is we've been talking about an environment that welcomes the Holy Spirit. God moves in places. God moves in people's lives. God moves in churches and within groups where there's an openness, there's a welcoming attitude, there's a hunger, and there's a thirst for the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Hallelujah. Haven't you been blessed just by hearing about the revival that's taking place on these, on these campuses? Many of them, uh, you know, I know some people say, well, you know, they're Christian campuses. Hey, there's been so much ungodliness that has infiltrated these Christian universities to where uh, uh, just complete and utter darkness has taken over. But praise God, hallelujah, that there's a remnant of God's people that still hunger and thirst for the move of God, that contend for the move of the Spirit, that say, I won't live without it. I won't do without it, Lord. Pour out your Spirit on me. Move in my life. Move in this place. Move in my family. Move in my church. Move on my school. Hallelujah. Do what you want to do. We're here believing for that. We're here desiring that. And where God finds people that are willing to move and flow with the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, nothing is restrained. When he finds an environment of faith, where he finds an environment of unity, he finds an environment of worship and honor towards him, he finds an environment where the Holy Spirit is welcome to move in all of his fullness buckle up friend 
God is going to do great and mighty things in that kind of place. Hallelujah. Because I'm telling you, I'm not just hungry for God's presence. I thank God for his presence, and we experienced that tonight. I'm not just hungry to have uh, that tangible, you know, the realness of God revealed to me. I want the Holy Ghost and everything he's got. I want the Holy Ghost and all of his fullness. Now, not everybody can say that. Because not in every person's uh, life or heart or church have they been uh, taught to be welcoming to that. When I talk about being welcoming and inviting to the Holy Spirit in His fullness, I'm talking about the gifts of the Spirit. I'm talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. I'm not just talking about being baptized in water. I'm not just talking about being baptized in the body of Christ. I'm talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost in fire. Where you speak in other tongues. Hallelujah. We got to talk about that. We got to teach about that. Why? So that people can see what they ought to be hungry for. So that people can see what they ought to be desiring. So that people can see what they ought to be welcoming towards in their life. Amen. I'm talking about the, the manifestations and the operations of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, God wants to saturate this earth with a move of His Spirit. And He's going to move where people are open. He's so good that He will move in your life to the degree that you will let Him. He will move in your life to the degree that you're hungry and desiring of Him. Amen. But where you put up the don't come any further sign, He's a gentleman and He won't move any further in your life even though He's got more to give to you. Amen. So I want to talk a little bit more about this openness about this hunger that we're supposed to have towards the Holy Spirit. You see in the Bible example after example after example where he only moves where there's that hunger, where that, there's that desire for him. He will move in those places, but he, he can't move where there's not that openness. Say, I'm open. I <laughs> tell you, I'm open. Amen. Uh, you go over to Acts chapter 1, and while you're doing that, I just want to review a little bit from last week. We talked a little bit about uh, some of this. We, we looked at Ephesians 4 and verse 30. It says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Remember us talking about that. Don't grieve or reject the Holy Spirit. You know, um, He's like that bird. Remember we talked about that. He's like the dove. He's typified as the dove, that tender, gentle um, bird where if you deal harshly with like a dove, you know, you can deal harshly with a pigeon, you can deal harshly with other birds, and they won't budge. But you deal harshly with a dove, and, and they'll go away. Well, the Holy Spirit is like that. If, if you don't understand about the Holy Spirit, God's not mad at you because you're ignorant about something. We're all ignorant about something. Isn't that the truth? The more you study and the more you find out about you know, different things in the Word of God, the more you realize how ignorant you are. I'm telling you. There's so much to know. There's so much to learn. So God's not upset or mad at people because they don't know about the Spirit or they've never been taught about the Holy Spirit. But learn. Learn. Get, get in the Bible. Read your Bible. Find out about the Spirit's ministry to the church. Find about, out about the Spirit's ministry to the believer's life. But don't just reject it. 
oh, I just don't want anything to do with that. Don't, do, don't, don't reject the Holy Spirit because he can't move in places where people reject him. Amen. Amen. Then we looked over here at um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. It says, quench not the Spirit. And we talked about that a little bit, about how uh, to quench means to extinguish or to like put out a fire. I'm glad that when I got filled with the Holy Ghost, I got some fire. Yeah. <laughs> that he baptized you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Hallelujah. And so we have a fire in us, but you can quench that fire. You can extinguish that fire. Well, how do you do that? I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that either. But you can do that. The Amplified talks about being un unresponsive to the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you, nudges you, prompts you, leads you, you know, he's, he's working, he's trying to work in your heart, he's trying to work in your life, and you're just not responding to him. We call that uh, sitting on the Holy Ghost. You're just sitting on the Holy Ghost, you're just ignoring, or maybe you're just not interested. I mean, people can get to that stage where they're just so cold. And listen, we have all, anybody that's walked with the Lord any period of time, you can get in a spiritual slump. You can get in a spiritual stupor. You know what I mean? You can grow, we, we've, we've all done it. But see, that's why you need the Holy Ghost. Because when you yield to Him, when you pray in the Spirit, you edify yourself. You build yourself up. Hallelujah. You, you start stoking that fire down on the inside of you. But if you're unresponsive to the Holy Spirit, you're quenching the Spirit and you'll grow cold. I'm telling you, just because you got filled with the Holy Ghost 30 years ago. I mean, I have people... Oh, I remember when I got filled with the Holy Ghost and I went down there and they laid hands on me and I spoke with other tongues. Well, when's the last time that you prayed in the Spirit? Well, it was 30 years ago. Well, then you need to get with it. You need to get in your prayer closet and you need to pray in the Spirit and you need to stir yourself up. Hallelujah. You need to build yourself up on your most holy faith praying in other tongues hallelujah. hallelujah don't be satisfied with an experience you've had 30 years ago and then the holy spirit moves on you to pray moves on you to pray in the spirit and you just don't respond listen you'll grow cold that way I'm, I'm, we gotta we gotta quit this coldness thing this dead church thing this dead walk with God thing. You know what I'm talking about? I love being a part of a spirit-filled group of believers. I love being a part of a spirit-filled church. Because by the time Wednesday gets here, I need church. You know what I mean? By the time Wednesday gets here, I need to be around a, a group of people that have a fire. I need, to, I need to together with them stir myself up. And then by the time Sunday gets here, I need it again. Oh, hallelujah. Come on. Mm -hmm. I can miss one Sunday on vacation and I can tell it. Yeah. Like, I got to get back to church. Yeah. I got to get back with my spirit filled family amen where we can we can stoke that fire within each other yeah. amen it blesses me to see people respond to the holy spirit you see somebody take off running in church well they're just wild no they're not wild they're responding to the holy ghost yeah. amen so don't quench the spirit but respond to the spirit I'm going to hurry, but it, uh, we talked about uh, Hebrews 10, 29, insulting the spirit of grace. You know, the, I don't want to do that. I don't want to insult the Holy Spirit. The way you insult the Holy Spirit is to be 
demeaning about him. Isn't it amazing when you start talking about the Holy Ghost around the world and even some Christians, the demeaning attitude that people have, the disrespectful attitude that people have towards the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, I just think oh, that's just devilish. I just think that people that speak with tongues, they might just have a devil. I've heard people talk that way, and I think, how disrespectful to the Holy Spirit. You would be better off claiming ignorance. You would be, I'll just say this, we all need to walk in a spirit of humility. There's just some things we may not know about or know enough about, but it doesn't mean it's not true. You know what I'm saying? And I think we could say that about a lot of things in the Bible. You know, we are ignorant about a lot of things. We're all, we're ever learning, ever growing in our knowledge of the Word. But if you don't know about the Holy Spirit, that would be the best thing you could say is, I just don't know. I haven't studied it. No one's really taught me. Then for you to say something disrespectful towards the Holy Spirit. You know, our, our, our society is so, um, uh, I don't know the right word to say about this. They're so far behind and ignorant when it comes to honor, respect, the Bible says so much about that. And to see people be so disrespectful towards the Spirit. I'm going to tell you something. God knows best. And His ways are best. And one of His ways is speaking in other tongues. He picked it. He chose that. So who are we to be demeaning towards the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. You may not understand them, but just claim ignorance. But don't be, at the very least, be respectful. Be respectful towards the Holy Spirit. And then to insult the Holy Spirit means that you're dismissive of Him. I've come across a lot of Christians that have the attitude well, you know, yeah, you know, I used to I used to speak in tongues and I used to pray in the spirit, but you know, I just I don't I don't really need that in my life anymore. You know, I did it way back then, but you know, I I'm a, I, I just don't really need that. And I'm thinking to myself, how sad to be so dismissive. And I don't ever want to get there. I I I we, we can all be a castaway in a lot of different things, can't we? Yeah. If, you don't, if you don't continue on with the truth you know, you can let go of it. And you might be shocked at how quickly you can let go of it and drift away. It's the truth. But I don't ever want to get to a place in my life when, where I forget the value and the preciousness of what the Holy Spirit has brought to my life. Because I'm telling you, when I got saved, I was telling somebody this on Sunday, when I got saved, that dramatically changed my life. But when I got filled with the Holy Ghost, when I got filled with the Holy Ghost, that did something in my life that was so powerful. The Holy Spirit came into my life and I began to pray when I didn't know how to pray. I began to be edified. I began to uh, understand the Word. You know, you can't even understand the Word without the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, you can sit there and read and read and read and read and read and get nothing. And when I sit down to study, I start by praying in the Spirit. And when I pray in the Holy Ghost, 
and then I begin to open the good word of God, it just comes off the page. The Holy Spirit begins to reveal it to me in a way that I would never be able to understand it on my own. Don't forget what the Holy Spirit has brought to you in your life. Amen. Don't ever be dismissive of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's disrespectful. And it's really insulting to Him. Amen. I wish I could get a better amen on it than that, but it's the truth. It's the truth. And so we need to keep stirred in our hunger. We need to, get, we need to stay stirred in our uh, openness towards the Holy Spirit. And we need to continue uh, understanding this cooperation that we have with the Lord. Now, are you over in Acts chapter 1? Uh, I want to I show you an, an example in the scriptures of how you have to be open to and you have to be hungry for the Holy Spirit to experience what he has to give to your life. Over here in Acts chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse uh, 4. Now, uh, before we get into this, I want to say this. If you read over in uh, 1 Corinthians, it talks about how there were 500 people. I want you to remember that number. There were 500 people that Jesus gave the command to, to wait for the promise of the Spirit. 500 people. And so he says here in first, uh, first, or Acts uh, 1, in verse 4, it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them. Now that's an interesting word. It wasn't something that he was suggesting. He wasn't just you know throwing this out here as an option. He commanded them. He commanded them to go and wait for the promise of the Spirit. He wanted them to receive this in their life. Why? Because they needed the equipping of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that even Jesus himself did not enter into his ministry until he was equipped by the Holy Spirit? Jesus. There wasn't any water turning into wine. There wasn't no water walking. There wasn't no, you know, fishes and loaves being multiplied until he was equipped. Remember, he went down to the River Jordan and John baptized him. Remember that? He was baptized by John. And then the Holy Spirit came upon him. And after that, he entered into his ministry. Now, when it comes to us, he wants us to have that same experience. He wants us to have that same equipping. Well, I'm saved. Is that not enough? Being born again does not mean that you are fully equipped to do everything that God has called you to do. You know, I'm just telling you, there is a lot of people that, 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 that start out even in ministry and they don't have, they don't have the, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in their life and the enemy comes at them to hinder them, to stop them. And you can't come against the devil with your self-help book. You can't come against the devil in your own understanding. There is an equipping from the Holy Spirit that the church needs to fulfill their assignment. There is an equipping that you need in your life to fulfill your assignment. 
Well, I'm not called to the ministry. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Every person in the body of Christ has a calling upon their life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may not stand in the fivefold ministry, but you are called to reach the world, reach your family. You're called to share the love of God. There's an anointing on you for specific things. You know, uh, there can be an anointing on you and a calling on you for business. I understand that. I was not uh, raised in a family of ministers. I was raised in a family of businessmen who were equipped by the Holy Spirit to do it and to do it well and to be a blessing to the body of Christ. And their success is not in what they could do in the natural. It was by the help of the Holy Spirit that got them to where they were in their business. There's an equipping on you to be a teacher. There's an equipping on you to be a mechanic. Whatever it is, hallelujah, that God has called you to do, he wants to equip you by way of the Holy Spirit to fulfill that. I know as the church, there is no way, no how, we can do what we're called to do without the Holy Ghost, without the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. That's why he said, I'm gonna, just let me read a verse to you. Stay where you're at. Let me see where it's at. Luke, Luke 24, 49. Jesus is speaking here. He said, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Jesus said, don't do anything else. Don't go anywhere else until the Holy Spirit has come upon you and equipped you with power from on high. Hallelujah. And so that's what he gives to the church because we need it. Remember he sent out the 12? Remember he gave them authority over unclean spirits, sent out the 70? Well, then he sent the church, the whole church, into the world to preach the gospel and to do the works of Christ. But he said, don't go until you're equipped with the Holy Spirit. This is important that we're open to this. Amen. So he said here in Acts, we're still in Acts chapter 1 verse 4, being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but he said, wait. If Jesus says to wait, <laughs> what do you need to do? You'd think you would wait. He said, wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For truly, John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And so Jesus commanded them to do this. You know, after, after the resurrection, you know, he spent some time with them taught them about the kingdom, you know, um, and, and, you know, they were excited. They were, they were just full of enthusiasm and zeal to get out there and start telling people about Jesus. Get out there and start preaching the gospel. But he said, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do anything. Don't go anywhere until the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now look down, drop down to verse 12. How many did he give the command to? 500. So when you look at verse 12, this was after his ascension, you know, up into heaven. They all saw him, you know, ascend up into the clouds. 
Verse 12, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, Simon, <laughs> Judas, the brother of James. And these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus. I like what Jesse DePlanis said. He goes, this is how I get all the Catholics filled with the Holy Ghost. I tell them that Mary went up to the upper room. He said, if I can show them that Mary went up to the upper room, they're ready to go up to the upper room too. Amen. And then look at verse 15. He said, and in those days Peter stood up in the midst of, his, or of the disciples and said, now look at this, the number of names together were about 120. So he gave the command to 500 people and 120 of them show up to find out what the promise of the Spirit was all about. What happened to 380 of them? What, what happened to 380 of them? I mean, probably not much different than today. You know, the excuses that people have. They were busy. They had things to do. Here's a thought. Maybe they just weren't interested enough. Maybe they just weren't hungry enough. But regardless of what it was, they didn't get to experience the equipping of the Holy Spirit. Only the ones, I mean, I mean, can you imagine having that experience attached to you, you know, throughout your whole life? Like, you know, hey, Kathy over there, she was in the upper room. Like she was there. She saw the cloven tongues upon each one and, and, and she was there when like a rushing mighty wind the Holy Spirit filled the room. That's amazing. But more should have been there. More could have had that experience. But here's the thing. God can't move on an attitude of, I don't care. God can't move on an attitude of, I don't want it, or I, I'm, I'm okay with what I've got. You understand what I'm saying? The hungry experienced it. The hungry and the ones that desired to know, what is this? What's he talking about? The promise of the Spirit? I'm going to be there. I'm going I'm to be there, man. I'm not missing out. That's why I, you know, people are, you know, everybody's, you know, negative on all these college campuses having revival. And, you know, why are all these people going? And, you know, blah, 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 blah. I'm thinking, why not? I know it's the same Holy Ghost that's in California, but 
I don't know if you have a leading to go. What's wrong with going? You understand what I'm saying? If you're hungry and you're thirsty, go for it. Go where the Spirit leads you to go. In that, in that day, the upper room was the place to be because that's where the Holy Spirit was going to move. And 500 of them have it, had an invitation to be there, but only 120 of them showed up for the equipping that Jesus wanted them to have. Go, let, me, let me show you another. Go over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. While you're going over there, um, let me read to you out of Acts 19. You get anything out of this tonight? The, what, what I'm talking about are examples that show you the hungry get it. The open get it. The ones who desire get it. They're the ones that are going to experience what God wants to do in the earth today. Amen. He wants to move by his spirit. But you got to be hungry for it. If you're in a slump, stir yourself up. If you don't have a hunger, ask the Holy Spirit to put one in you. Hallelujah. He will do that. He will put a hunger and a thirst in your heart for the things of God. Don't drop off now. My goodness, we haven't come this far to quit now. Are you kidding? I haven't served God this long and been in the river this long to jump over onto the banks and just be ankle deep. Amen. There's a lot of distractions out there. But you got to push all that back and say, you know what, I'm staying focused on God. I'm staying focused on what the Holy Spirit wants to do. I'm not backing up. All right, Acts 19. I hope you're getting something out of this. I'm going to read out of Acts 19. Acts 19 says this. We talked about this last week, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? That's interesting. Since you've gotten saved, have you received the Holy Ghost? Well, I already got the Holy Ghost when I got saved. Yes, we went over that. You do have the Spirit of Christ in you. Yes, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, but there is a separate experience apart from salvation, and it is the baptism of the Holy Spirit with tongues. Amen. And I find it interesting that Paul found it important to ask them this question. You're saved, but are you filled with the Holy Ghost? Now notice their response. And they said unto him, We have no, not so much as even heard where there be any Holy Ghost. Do you know how many Christians are right here? I mean, so many. Love God devoted to God. I mean, they couldn't get more devoted and committed to God if they tried. Their hearts are just totally sold out to God. But they have no idea that there's a fullness of the ministry of the Holy Spirit that is available to them. I thank God that in this last day, there is going to be an outpouring of the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit's going to fall like the, the former and the latter rain together. Hallelujah. The move of the Spirit is going to be present. Hallelujah. And people are going to jump. People that are open. People that are hungry. I believe that's happening now on our campuses, that, that there's a stirring, that, that these, these young people are seeing there's more. They're hungry for more. And they're beginning to see there's more available to you. Amen. But I also know people that, you know, are presented with truth. 
presented with the revelation of the Holy Spirit. They can read their Bible. They can see it right there in the Scripture. But they hold back because of tradition or, you know, well, you know, I've, I wasn't raised, you know, to believe that or, or whatever. And they reject. They're not ignorant anymore. They reject as an act of their own will the Holy Spirit. And God loves them. And God's going to move in their life as much as he can. But he's not going to force it on people. You know, if you reject the Holy Spirit, and this, this might shake some people up, you are really rejecting Jesus. You're not rejecting him as Savior, but you're rejecting him as baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Let me read a verse to you. Can I read this to you? I know a lot of people don't like this, but can we read our Bible? We can read, right? Matthew 3, 11. I'll, I'll read it to you. You can go there with me. This is John the Baptist speaking. He said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He, who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So Jesus is not just Savior. He's not just Savior. He is the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. And he wants that for you. He wants to give him to you. He wants the Holy Spirit to come in and set your heart ablaze. He wants the Holy Spirit to come in and to perform his ministry in all of his fullness in your life. But you can, with your will, limit him from doing that. And stop that experience in your life. And others that are open, others that are hungry, will experience and walk in it and be, I mean, just on fire, equipped, supernaturally doing stuff for God. And you'll just be left with what you're open to. Well, I just, I just want the presence. Well, well, you'll get it. But you need the fire. You need the tongue. Well, I think that's just for the disciple. Well, let's look at another verse. Acts 2.1. See, I'm, 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 I am determined... I'm determined that over the next couple of weeks or however long I preach on this, we get this out, this doubt about the Holy Spirit out of people's hearts and minds. With the Word, you can get it out. You know what I'm saying? It's like a splinter. Have you ever gotten a splinter out? You know, and you, you, get, you get it out, and then you see there's just like a little piece left in there. What do you got to do? You got to dig that out you got to dig every little piece of that splinter out. When it comes to this, the devil through tradition and religion has robbed so many people of an experience that God wants them to have. They have been robbed of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the Spirit because of ignorance or wrong teaching. But the Bible, praise God, makes it plain to us that it is for us. It is for all of us that are born again. I want to show you something here. I'm, i got to hurry. Uh, but look at Acts 2. And, it, and we'll start in verse 1. And it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with 
one accord and in one place. The they that it's talking about is not just disciples. Who were they? Believers. These were people that followed the Lord. These were people that followed Jesus. They believed in him. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them, all of them, cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each one of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This was for all of the believers on the day of Pentecost and it's for all believers today. Pentecost has never stopped. Hallelujah. Are you a believer? Are you a follower of the Lord? Then you are a candidate to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is for every believer. He wants all of his children equipped for their heavenly assignment. Hallelujah. Are you over in 2 Timothy <coughs> chapter 3? I'm just going to give you two more verses, can I? <laughs> 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5, this is talking about the last days. It says, having a form of godliness, what does that mean? That's just a formality, you know, religion. A form of religion. You know, we think of different things, different people, you know, that do different formal things, you know, when they come to church, you know, they got to light candles and, you know, you know, incense or stuff like that. But, you know, you can have a form of religion and go to a Pentecostal church. You know, it can just be a formality to you. But I love what it says here having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Now that word power there is dunamis power. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Holy Ghost, dunamis power. They deny the dunamis power. And it goes on to say, from such turn away. Well, you know, you got people. I, I, just don't, I just don't need that power stuff. Well, I do. I do. I need that dunamis power stuff. You, you know why? The devil's not playing. The devil is not playing. You've got the kingdom of darkness attacking people with the spirit of fear. A spirit, a spirit of oppression, spirit of infirmity, spirit of poverty, spirit of depression, spirit of suicide. You've got all these things and you're going to come back at that with your little powerless gospel what's your recourse well just just whatever God wants well you're going to get run over I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to you you're going to be tore up by the devil you're going to be a mental mess you're going to be sick in your body and suffering in your body and your family suffer and your finances suffer because all you want is a powerless form of godliness 
I don't want that. I don't want that. I want the power in my life. I need the power of God in my life so that when the devil comes against me to stop, to hinder, to oppress, to make me sick, to make me broke, I've got something down on the inside that rises up. I've got a boldness. Hallelujah. The dunamis power flowing in my life. To come against that. That's why so many churches closed during COVID. They were powerless against the powers of darkness that ranged against them. They didn't know what to do. So they just shut the doors. But I'm telling you, there's a church that's filled with the power of God. There's a remnant of people that understand we need the power. We want the power. We've got the power, hallelujah, of the Holy Spirit. Come on. Dunamis power. That's the power that heals. That woman with the issue of blood, and she went and touched the hem of his garment, and virtue flowed out of him. Virtue, virtue, translated dunamis, dunamis, dunamis power flowed out of him. To her. Don't tell me we don't need the power. Don't tell me you can live without it. Let me give you another verse, and we've got to get out of here. Mark 12. You got time to go over to one more? Mark 12. Hallelujah. Mark 12 and 24 says this, And Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye not therefore err? Another word for err is error. He said, are you not in error? (laughs) Because ye know not the scriptures. I mean, how many of you can agree that not knowing the scriptures as a Christian is error? To be satisfied with just being ignorant. I mean, it will cause you a world of trouble to be ignorant of the word of God. He said, you're in error because you don't know the scriptures, but he wasn't finished. He wasn't finished. He said, because you know not the scriptures, neither the power of God. That is a strong, strong statement. He said, it is error to not know the scriptures, and he said, it is equally an error to not know the power. We got to know the word and we got to know the power. We got to know the power, my friend. Well, I just don't know about those churches like yours. Everybody's just wild. Everybody's just radical. I don't want to be radical like that. You need to get over that. You need to get over that. You need to get in the Bible and see what Christians are supposed to look like. Christians are a little wild. Do you know that? And, and we're not, listen, we're not being wild to be wild. I know that there's a little bit of excess sometimes with some people. You understand what I mean? I mean, there's dancing in the Holy Ghost, and then you got somebody over here doing this. <laughs> doing the moonwalk, you know, and you're just like, I don't know about that. But I like what one preacher said. He said, I'd rather have a little bit of wildfire than no fire. And I, and I do agree with that. But, I, you know, I, I was reading over in Acts, and I thought, it is kind of wild to see the day of Pentecost they came stumbling out of the upper room like drunk people right and then they 
went into the crowd of people and would just go up to people. Now hear that? They got filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's just flowing out of them, and they're not stopping it. They get out into the streets, and they didn't all of a sudden stop. They just kept flowing. And they were going out to people in the streets, speaking in this heavenly language, and they didn't know this, but they were speaking to men in their own languages, and they were telling them about Jesus. Miracle! Manifestation of the Holy Spirit. But here's the thing, they didn't know that. They didn't know that that's what was happening. What were they doing? They were just flowing. They were just flowing with the Holy Spirit. It looked wild to the world or maybe to people that didn't understand it. And see, that's what Christians are so afraid of. Get over that and just be willing to flow with God. Just be willing to respond to the Holy Spirit. Just be willing to go with it. What the Holy Spirit is doing in the earth today, just go with it. I don't know if I'm helping anybody. We need the power of God. We need the power. You need the word and you need the power. You need the word and you need the power. It, it, it will change your whole life. I was, um, I was talking to somebody. I forgot who I was talking to. We were talking about this, about the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit will change a person's life. Smith Wigglesworth, I'm sure many in here have heard about Smith Wigglesworth and his ministry. Um, but if you read about his early life, it's really interesting. He was, I think, six years old when he had to go to work because they, you know, his family was just um, struggling, and so all the siblings went to work to help support the family. So he didn't get to go to school. And so he was uneducated, could not speak properly, but he got saved, and God called him into the ministry. Well, they said when he would get up to give a sermon, he was really hard to understand because he couldn't speak properly. He was uneducated. But one day, he got filled with the Holy Ghost. Wow. What does the Holy Ghost do? He equips you. <laughs> he equips you. And when he got filled with the Holy Spirit, he would stand in the pulpit and would speak in eloquent language. He spoke like an educated man as he just flowed out of his heart by way of the Holy Spirit. You don't know what you're missing out on. You don't know what you could do better with the help of the Holy Spirit. Did you get something out of that tonight? Hallelujah. Let's lift up our hearts and let's thank God for the Holy Ghost. Father, we just praise you tonight and we thank you for the Holy Ghost. Hey everybody, my name is Joey. Thank you so much for watching today. Hey everybody, my name is Joey. Thank you so much for watching today.
Hey everybody, my name is Joey. Thank you so much for watching today. Hey everybody, my name is Joey. Thank you so much for watching today.